Hi everyone, we're the Skeleton Crew, and today we are going to be taking a look at an armored dinosaur called Sauropelta. Before we look at Sauropelta, I think I should inform you that somebody is missing from our recording today, for what mm. is the first time in which I have won our perpetual battle. I have consumed Alex, and I'm keeping him prisoner inside my body right now. His spirit may erupt from me at some point, although I've trapped him in the second person, and he'll be unable to address me. Alex is trapped in a grammatical hell right now that he's going to be unable to escape from, because all of his dialogue, given that he's trapped in the second person, will be framed as reference to all of us instead of to himself. For instance, if you hear me at any point in the video say, help you, help you, please help you, don't listen. It's a trick. He's trying to fight for dominance again, and he may win if you aid him. I should also let you know that we have a Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> this joke is so off the rails. I was I was hoping that you would introduce yourself so that I could comment on you taking a bit too far or longer than it's funny or whatever. No, you're not so gonna do that. The bingo card. Is this the no. quickest bingo card fill we've gotten? I uh, I don't think nah, it is. Probably. No, because one one of them is a failed intro. <laughs> We're knocking out two birds with one stone. Okay. Um, Do birds come in threes? <laughs> I didn't but they think do come in funny. trees. Oh, you beat me to that. I was swallowing my fucking soda. I'm like, I got that. Um. Okay, yeah. So we have a Patreon page, and if you like our stuff, you should go support us there if you can. Um, if you like our videos, but you're not able to support us on Patreon, no hard feelings at all. We understand. But please, if you can, uh, leave a like on the video and leave a comment, because it really helps us out as we try to find more people to share uh, all of our knowledge of dinosaurs with. And we think that that's a really nice thing. And it makes us feel good when the subscriber number goes up. So number go up. Help it go up, please. It's it's the only thing keeping us going on our darkest days. Um, before we get into Sauropelta again now... Uh, I think I have to tell you that I'm Dr. James Napoli. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences at North Carolina State University. I don't have to tell you anything, but my name is Amelia Zietlow. I'm a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History. You must know this because it will be on your final exam. I am Scott Johnston, the vertebrate paleontology fossil preparator and technician at Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology. And I choose to tell you this, I tell you this, that I am Dalton Meyer, a PhD candidate at Yale University, currently living in a house of pestilence. <laughs> Together. <laughs> We're the skeleton, the skeleton crew. crew. Oh, Most, of it. Most of it. Most of it. Oh, God. Yeah, poor Alex. Um, he, he's ill. I'm sure he'll pour himself something. Yeah, pour one out for Alex, everybody. Um, he He's not himself these days. No free publicity. Right. Or should I say, <laughs> you are not yourself. Stop it. <laughs> Help you. <laughs> um, Reverend Meyer, would you please release Certainly. the animal? The very <laughs> reverend. <laughs> the very reverend Meyer. <laughs> I like him. Yeah. He's nice. Oh, this one looks like the little puzzle. It's the same color. So earlier, before the call, we were talking about the Sauropelta that lives in the big bone room in the Amen H, which is the basement where we keep all the big bones, naturally. And there's a Sauropelta head and neck. And in case you didn't know what the animal looked like, someone put a cute little puzzle Sauropelta figure. And he's, he's green and yellow, just like that. Oh. Hmm. And he does um, live there. The, he does live live. there. Yeah, no, well, he's it's like alive. An Indian in, it's an Indian in the cupboard situation. Yes. <laughs> what? All the toys came to life. Have you not yeah. seen that film? Yeah. I know. A long time it, ago. It's a good oh, yeah. one. Mm, I'm, right. I'm not sure if it's held up that well. It, it probably not. hasn't. I, I haven't watched it in a long time. I like how uh, after their birth they have to climb a steep hillside yeah. to, <laughs> so, <laughs> for whatever, to the meadow. For whatever reason, when I was building uh, our Cloverly Zone, um, putting the hatchery down caused a huge concavity <laughs> to form in the earth, whereas it, the rest is is a nice flat area. 
Well, actually, that that doesn't look dissimilar to how the Cloverly looks um, in real life because the Cloverly is very um, like friable sediment. Yeah, it looks like popcorn, kind of like gray popcorn. Oh, popcorn play. Yeah, yeah, it's it's terrible. And where at least where I saw the Cloverly in Wyoming um, when I was in high school, there are just these big like sinkholes everywhere because it erodes so easily. So it'll just be you're walking, and then there's just a hole that goes like so far down, light can't escape it. <laughs> um, yep, and they're just like don't fall into one. So yeah, um, uh, Dalton, but we'll talk the, more the, about the cloverly formation later. Dalton, yes. the image of the hatchery in this little thing just is making me think that it was like you threw it down from low Earth, yeah. Earth orbit or some <laughs> shit. They just like cratered into the ground. <laughs> That's basically what happened. Yeah, yeah, essentially. Oh, look at those ones run in the background. Look at them, look at them go trundling. Oh man, they got somewhere to be. Speed racer over here. <laughs> um, the tail's really is... long. Is it? Is it actually that long? So yeah, Sorapelta has a stupidly long tail, where uh, its tail actually makes up more than half of its body length. No. Yeah. No. No. This, the, the, is that the M and H one? Does it have a whole tail? Is uh, it? No, is it? I think it's actually missing some, and it's really long. That okay, uh, there's cool. like up to fifty vertebrae in the tail. Ugh. That's a good number. From, from some estimations, like th there are some that have like like forty some odd, uh, and they're incomplete. That's bad. Um, like, Sorapelta had an incredibly long tail. I kind of like it. Oh, okay. It's cool. Mm -hmm. It's elegant. I like the way it moves back and forth. Yeah, and it's it's something that, like, okay. R riddle me riddle me this, Batman. Uh, have, we t have we talked about um, ossified tendons much on the channel yet? I don't think no. so. No, I don't. Um, did, we, did we mention we, them in the Velociraptor video? I think we mentioned them maybe in Velociraptor and also a little bit in um, Euoplocephalus. Mm. Mm. Yes. Because a lower... Uh, I, almost said, I almost called this a lower titan. A lower titan, Why? folks. A lower titan. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a lower titan. Listen to the trumpeting noises it's making that are much better than the ones that a lower titan makes. <laughs> um, but... Uh, so on Sorapelta, it, it does have some of these ossified tendons that would have limited its, like, f mobility of its tail. The, even though it has this big old long, uh, like, spiked studded tail, it wouldn't have been as flexible as we talked about with, like, Stegosaurus, with that incredible quote from Bakker of that it was designed for 3D combat um, <laughs> where it was just a big old long rat monkey tail with spikes on it that could swing all over the place. Uh, these guys were a whole lot more stiff and uh, they were actually one of the things that I remember us talking about in our, our Euoplocephalus video is that with the the other group of ankylosaurs, the ankylosaurids, ankylosauridae, ankylosaurids, ankylosaurines, ankylosaurids, ankylosaurids, uh, the the tail club ones, is that they kind of had like a hammer for a tail in that it was like a very sh a very like stiff shaft with the club at the end and it was really only f don't don't look at me in that tone of voice jimbo um that it was only kind of flexible at the base and uh but it was relatively stiff later stop it <laughs> <laughs> it seems like uh notosaurids or at least sauropelta might have just been a bit less flexible overall um, but nowhere near as stiff or as flexible as the different parts of the ankylosaurids' tails. There is one thing that I'm going to bring up here, which is that the ossified tendons of Velociraptor and, uh, do not seem to have limited lateral mobility as much as is usually assumed. It's mostly vertical mobility, right? No, well, 
Um, I, that they limit? I think so. Yeah. Um, so there's a Velociraptor specimen. Um, it was it's in the collections of the Mongolian Academy of Sciences, um, but it's repositive right now at the AMH because it was found by AMH crews, where the tail is like twisted into a sinuous S shape. Mm -hmm. All of these super cool so, specimen. And with Velociraptor, it's a couple of things because they've got these long prezygopophyses where the the vertebral articulations that form like essentially like lateral buttresses against each other. Um, so you've got the prezygopophysis of one vertebra comes forward and meets the postzygopophysis of the other. Um, and they they just interlock, right? These are called articular facets in human anatomy. Um, they just are kind of guiding the side-to-side -side motions and rotational motions of the vertebrae. In Velociraptor, the prezygopophyses extend forward like 10 vertebrae, I think more in some cases. So they're really long. And then there's also ossified tendons in the tail. It was anticipated that what that did was it made the tail into one solid rod that could not flex um, until we found that S-curved one where everything is still articulated. Um, it's just, you know, everything looks fine. It looks like it could curve like that. I guess what I'm saying is just I would be a l what what? I have a friend. I have is a ladybug. Oh, oh. Look at a new wow. that's Alex manifesting in your apartment. <laughs> listen, <laughs> listen closely. Listen closely. You have been transformed into a ladybug by James Napoli to silence you. <laughs> Set you free. Alex, Alex, can you hear me? Can you speak? Oh, you, gee, you. Alex. No, you're not supposed to say that. We're we, we're going to have to bleep you. He's just chilling here. Okay. That's cool. That's good. Uh, um, yeah, so anyway, all I'm saying is that I think in the absence of formal work that's done to assess range of motion, I would be a little bit cautious about accepting some of the things that even look very obvious externally. Like, you really need to see how the articular surfaces play on each other, um, often with 3D models of the bones, to really get a sense of all the motion that's possible. Well, so you're saying you just gotta play with the bones? That's what I'm saying. Get a feel for them. But not exactly. too much. You'll go blind. Another point I was just going to add on that is another thing that it seems that people like discount or, or don't fully take into consideration as much when it talk when we talk about like range of motion specifically on things like tails and with ossified tendons and stuff is that bone is a whole lot more flexible than you think it is, especially mm -hmm. when it is long and stringy. Oh my god, I this is there's there's a documentary about bones and I can't remember where I think it was on Curiosity Stream I don't know but they did this horrible thing where they took they took bone and then in one experiment they like removed the calcium out of it and the other experiment they removed the collagen out of it or whatever because it's basically all it is and I, I'm messing up the details it's like they were they removed the hard part in one and they removed the soft part mm -hmm. in the other and and obviously you remove the the soft part or the flexible part and it just shatters. But then in the other one where it's just the collagen, they like hit it with a mallet and it just like boings and it's disgusting so and I cool. hate it. It's so cool, but it's so horrible. That. Yeah. Oh. Um, I, I, re I remember this conversation happening particularly with the, this guy keeps like rearing his ugly head. It's going to be like Beetlejuice where we say it three times. It shows up with the Spinosaurus um, uh, with the new swimmy tail uh, that was proposed where people were saying like hey those spinous processes are really really long on here like if they were bending in, in, in close and soft tissue uh laterally then they might bend too much uh, like they're uh they those break. are stiff structures they would break and then people pointing out it was like yeah but they're really long thin bone they would just kind of add rigidity to it it wouldn't necessarily like snap right as if like fi fish also don't have bony like rays in their fins no, no, no. And every fish I've ever seen that swims its tail a little fast, uh, the tail just shatters like glass. This is the scientific inspiration, like many things in SpongeBob, which are inspired by science. For the fish Shut who up. has uh, glass bones and paper skin. <laughs> and every morning he breaks his arms um, and every evening he breaks his legs. One thing that I think is worth... I'm sorry, Dalton, I didn't mean to not laugh at that. It's it okay. funny. You were on um, a tear. I was on a tear. One thing to also keep in mind is that different bones have different mechanical properties. And the mechanical properties of a single bony element can actually vary over its um, uh, like over its length or over its width. Um, this is a term in material science that's referred to as um, anisotropy. 
Well, no, this is an anisotropy. It's heterogeneous and it's anisotropic. So it's different throughout and it's different in different directions. So you'll have like a strong direction that the bone, like bo bones are generally good in compression. There are not a lot of natural situations in which your bones are loaded in tension. So the bone ain't great at resisting tension. So if you stretch somebody's femur, let's say, it will break with not a lot of force. If you compress it, you can bear like, I want to say a human femur can go to like a thousand pounds of weight or something like that. Yeah, easily this and one's crumble. another another horrible experiment on this bone documentary is I, obviously it wouldn't have been a human femur, but I have no idea what kind of femur it was. But they loaded a femur in it just to show like in one direction where they laid it sideways, which is not quite tension, but it's just to show how bones are built to do specific things and handle stress in specific ways and that's why they break it's when you apply stress in a way that it wasn't meant to do and so like when you lay a femur sideways it snaps i think it was a cow femur probably because yeah. those are pretty readily accessible if you ever get like a dinosaur bone for your dog for christmas it's a cow femur probably um so they do it sideways and they apply weight to it and it snaps like immediately but then they turned it upright you know how a cow stands and apply pressure and it lasts way longer than you'd expect it to and then explodes which is horrifying <laughs> but it takes a while to get to the explosion point well i mean so, like think think about what human bodybuilders do right yeah. like the like uh, the, the the guy who played the mountain on game of thrones half thor julius bjornsson like i've seen him deadlift 1400 pounds well, even Which, without going that extreme, just think about things that you do. Like, think about running, jumping, jumping down. Yeah. yeah. Think about jumping at all or, like, jumping at, down, like, the last two steps. I don't mm -hmm. know. You know, just... I, it's it's wild, you know? Yeah. Because it's strong. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, so Scott, go ahead. With, with, with bones being much better at compression than tension, so you would... Like, hypothetically, this would be a really good material to make a, uh, an experimental submarine out of, as opposed to carbon fiber, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it would be better. Uh, uh, deep with the bone submersible. The, so, <laughs> bone submarines oh my are God. really good, this is, Bone sub. This is, this is half related. I went to uh, MoMA yesterday with, with another student and a postdoc here, and there was, like, this sculpture that we were, like, looking at. We're like, well, we saw a vertebra. There was an isolated vertebra. We're like, we know what that is. And then I was looking closer. I was like, wait a minute. And it was like a blob. It was like made of bronze or whatever. But it's a sculpture that basically looks like a bunch of it's like a mass with like various identifiable identifiable bones coming out of it. And I turned to I think I can't remember which one it was or if it was both of them. I'm like, this is this is the remains they're pulling up from the from the <laughs> Titan. Because it, it was just like a mass. It was, it was horrible. But it was kind of funny. So, so the point I'm getting at. Yeah is that um, the material property of bone is very complex. And what you often will think of as like what a, would quote unquote break the bone is difficult to determine, right? They are evolved to be loaded in the way that they're loaded. Different bones also have um, different resilience and a different work of fracture, which is just, you know, refers to the amount of work you need to put into the bone to actually break it. It means what it says. So the work of fracture in um, deer antlers, for instance, is very high. They've got a greater collagen component. They're not as brittle or rigid. They're made to flex. That's because they are long, thin structures that get loaded in extreme ways. So they have to be able to, you know, they have to be able to bend a little bit. And they do. So, uh, and I remember, Scott, we were actually talking about this, you and I, at lunch one day with the Spinosaurus fin thing, because this was back in the glorious days where we did work together and saw each other every day. Good old days. Good old days. Um, and uh, we were talking about, like, you know, would the fin rays of Spinosaurus's tail be able to deflect by the amount you'd need to for it to be a fin? Uh, I think, I don't think there's any way to assess this now that they're fossilized, but probably, the, the, probably they were very resilient with a high work of fracture. Like, they might have been equivalent to deer antler, where they were a little bit spongier and softer, so they could undergo that sort of deformation. Right, that's not something you want your femur to do. Like under high weight, you don't want it to bend. Um, and, but it has and to if be it, able to a little bit. And if anything, they could probably, at least on Spinosaurus, act like m kind of a spring to kind of help some right. uh, redirect some energy back on the thing. But so, like, let's bring this back to Sauropelta. Wait, no, and... I'm, not, I'm not ready yet. Hold on. I'm not ready yet. Never I've got mind. another point. Let's, 
Let, let's Sorry. not talk about the animal that's um, on screen. No. <laughs> I was thinking just I was thinking about just the other factor to that I think is not often considered with dinosaurs because we think of dinosaurs as bones because that's what we find them as. Um is like correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not in no way a physicist or biomechanist. Um, but doesn't like the fact of like muscles attaching to the bone also help like distribute do you, do you see what I'm getting at? Like a bone um, isolated is not going to have the same properties as it does when it's actually part of the system where you've got these different muscles tugging on it in different points. For for some functions, yes. For overall things, no. Okay. So like, um, so like, if we talk about the example of like how much weight could a human squat before the femur breaks? Um, like the, if you assume the muscular system can sustain it, like if you're half Thor Bjorns and you go for a two ton deadlift. And that's too much and your femur breaks. Mm -hmm. The muscular action is not going to be able to counteract that because ultimately all the weight still has to go through the femur. Like, yeah. there's no way to do that. But no, I'm thinking, are... I am thinking more about, like, a swimmy tail. Like, well, that seems it... like, those seem like little structures that are braced by soft tissue and are probably stronger than they appear. The, I don't think the soft tissue would do a lot in that situation, but uh, one where I, I think this is something that really applies very well is, like, um, jumping and landing, right? So if you... I remember one of the labs at, at Brown University where I was an undergrad was doing a lot of research when I was there with dropping turkeys from height and seeing what they do, which is a wonderful... <laughs> Live turkeys? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you drop. Um, They're birds. <laughs> This was the lab of um, a biomechanist uh, and functional morphologist named Tom Roberts, um, who studies, he basically, like, his main thing is tendons, like, on a mechanical level and the evolutionary significance of different tendon structures. His thing is tendons. Um, so he was looking at the, at the gastrocnemius tendons in turkeys, which is the main calf muscle, so, like, our Achilles tendon. And they had implanted, like, strain meters in the turkeys and everything. So what they did is when they would, were dropped from a height, um, like Amelia said in the jumping example, when you jump, you have to transmit uh, multiples of your body weight through your legs very, like, suddenly and, and quickly, right? And that force could break them. Um, if you remember physics, or if you haven't taken physics yet, here's your little preview. I don't know what um, physics is. F equals MA. Fma. Which means that, right, force Fma. equals mass times acceleration. So what you can do... I thought the force was determined by metachlorians in your blood. <laughs> it, it is. It is. No, I thought that was being able to, like, sense it. No, no, the force the force is generated by the metachlorians. Well, no, the force, force is generated by all living things. It's, I was going to say, correct. I didn't think you were generating it. I thought it was, like, a thing. Not that I know that much about Star Wars, but my understanding is that it's a force in the universe that exists. I, I would love to get through some psychom. <laughs> No, 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 no. We're talking about midichlorians. <laughs> midichlorians um, are psychom. No, they're not. Stop. They're also the barely the canon um, because few people consider them canon. Um, what? So, uh, anyway, I'll get, we'll get into that later. So, no, F, explain. F <laughs> equals MA. Force equals mass times acceleration. So if you are dropping from a height, your mass can't change. What you can change is the amount of time that you're landing for, which changes the acceleration if you want to decrease the force going through the bone. So what... I'm just going to keep going. So <laughs> what the turkeys do, and this is getting at Amelia's point exactly, which is why I bring it up, is what the turkeys do when they're landing is they stretch their legs out, like really far, but without locking the joints, so that when they fall, the legs hit the ground first, and they can kind of like actively flex their legs to try to extend the amount of time they're landing for, which reduces the acceleration that they're experiencing and causes them to be able to not break their bones. So, like, that sort of thing is is a very, like, that's a very good example of how behavioral things and the influence of soft tissues and tendons and everything can reduce the actual amount of force that's experienced. In terms of, like, um, you know, standing up or something like that, that's where, like, you know, there, there's ultimately, like, a limit that does have to go through the skeleton. So I think, you know, there are cases where it doesn't work, but there are cases where it does. Scott, what were you laughing about? <laughs> <laughs> you, can't you, change, you, you can't change your mass during this period of time and stuff. And I'm just like, but what if I <laughs> myself? Like, <laughs> <mid> <laughs> <laughs> what if I just <laughs> 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 
<laughs> that's my survival stretch. It's like that, that one. It's like that one flight attendant who got like sucked out of a seven forty seven at forty thousand feet and survived the impact. Like she was just I, fine. She had like I, minor cuts and scratches I, and stuff. It was like, what if she? Wrong. She didn't survive that by shooting herself. <laughs> she, like, <laughs> she probably didn't. Shoot she herself. passed out. She doesn't know. Right. right? She woke oh, up yeah, on the that's ground. That's what I would say too. If I were like falling forty thousand feet. And I'm just as right. I'm like the ground is barreling towards me, and I'm like, if I time timing myself properly, I'll produce enough of a force that will act like a small jet pack and help the impact be non-fatal. She learned how to double jump. <laughs> so Sora Pelta. Yeah. What's its name mean? Oh it's so it's. Its name, I, I was joking about this with one of my friends earlier today, its name sounds like an ability that you would have as like a lizard folk in uh, a tabletop RPG. <laughs> like its name means lizard shield. Like it, it really yeah. does sound like a prevent one D4 damage sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, um, lizard shield. That's that's yep. a pretty good name for it, I think. There's, um, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Oh, there's a little, I mean, there's some history behind the name in that it was, it was discovered, um, oh god, when was the, when were the remains discovered? In the 1930s, but it wasn't named until the 19, like, 70s. And right. so at the AMNH, 70 kind of, exactly, actually. Yeah, at the AMNH, the kind of nickname, or the going name they had for it was the Peltosaur, which is Armored Lizard. And when John Ostrom went to name it, Peltosaurus is already taken. That name belongs to uh, a fossil anguid lizard. Uh, so a thing that's related to alligator lizards and glass lizards. It's a good name. It is a good name. It's a good fossil, too. I like Peltosaurus a lot. Um, and we're, in fact, three of us in this call are working on Peltosaurus. That's true. A little bit. Um, um, I mean, not that any of us are leading it. This is led by, um, you know, amazingly talented, um, my former undergrad and now incoming Gilder School student, um, Megan Forchelotti, who yes. is incredibly uh, talented and dedicated and simply a joy to work with and mentor. Um, and it's always very special when an undergrad that you train doesn't see the, the misery behind your eyes when every time she comes into the museum and works and joins the same graduate program you were a part of. She's got, she has like a misery filter yeah. on her glasses or something because she's just always so positive and I'm like, buddy, how? M Megan doesn't see misery. Um, but yeah, no, so Megan's leading a project with Peltasaurus, so this is just yeah. kind of a fun aside that um, a lot of us are going to publish on Peltasaurus at some point pretty soon. Yeah. Um, but Peltasaurus is a cool dude. And because Peltosaurus was already named Peltosaurus, and they had been calling this thing Peltosaur for so long, John Ostrom named this, and he's like, well, what if we just... <laughs> Uno, reverse. Uno reverse. Yeah, <laughs> and so it became Soro Pelta. That, that's funny. John also... Ostrom, I gotta say... Okay. John Ostrom gave things pretty good names. Yeah, he did. He, he, did. he very infrequently missed... Uh, and the species name, um, so the species name of Sorapelta is currently Edwards Orum. Uh, when it was named, uh, Ostrom named it Edwards I, and in either case, it was named in oh. honor of uh, Nell and Tom Edwards, who. Uh, oh, look at this sit. Oh. Gave help to the field crews who discovered a lot of the remains of Sorapelta, but that's, those are the Yale crews, so that's after the, the AMNH had already taken like the big ones. Um, but they were they they find uh, I think a lot of Sorapelta in the Cloverleaf Formation, um, and so it was named in honor of some people who helped them on the, the field crew. Uh, it was then later Edwards I was post hoc changed in the '90s to Edwards Orum uh, to be more in line with Latin grammatical rules in accordance to the ICZN, which uh, asks that names follow the the rules of Latin grammar. I have my own opinion of this, uh, which I'll share, which is I think it's a stupid rule. And <laughs> grammar's made up. I don't. I don't love the idea of a, of, a, of a second researcher changing the name of something for a non like biological reason. Like if you, if it needs to be moved yeah. to like a, like a species needs to get put in a different genus or a genus needs to be renamed something. Like I understand that for scientific reasons, sure. I don't love the idea of someone's work being changed 
purely in accordance with the grammar of a dead language. But I, I also don't think it's required anymore. I think this is something where like old standards, especially back when, you know, having an education in the sciences usually meant that you also mm-hmm. had an education in the like classical languages. I, I think that was, it might've been a rule at some point. And I think it was, you know, considered the standard that you should name it grammatically um, or in a grammatically correct way. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's explicitly not required anymore. Like things have to be Latinized. Not so necessarily. Should, well, it no, kind of the to, the way that the name is like said in the general construction is still supposed to resemble the Latin name construction, mm-hmm. even though it can be in any language. Okay. I think they make a major exception for like non-Western languages. Which I was are about to say, I'm like, yeah, like right. a lot of the like a lot of the more recently discovered Chinese dinosaurs would like to have a word. With right, you. but but a lot of them are kind of like they're multiple words put together, so it's still the spirit of how they were constructed. But I think it's mm. more that like you're not supposed to just name it in English, even though you could. Yeah. Right. Um, like you should try to Latinize it a little bit. Like irritate um, or challenge or I, right? Or, or um, I mean, this one's like completely made up, right? Like fungus vermis, the, the funky yeah. vermis. But like oh, that yeah. is, you know, that is just the name is funny. It was intended to be funky worm, um, and that's literally what both of those words mean in Latin. But it's not like it's not you. It's a Latin word that means like smelly or something that is like funky, mm-hmm. fungus. And then vermis is Latin for worm, so you like it's Latinized, right? Even though it's not really how a Roman would say a funky worm, which is fine. It doesn't need to be. I'm I'm still thinking about like I saw a TikTok a little while ago where it was just I forget most of the setup for it, but it was like you bring a you bring a, a Roman into modern day and are showing him around to random things and bitter around and it's just him looking over a list of like items and it was like who is Matorsicles? <laughs> it's just motorcycles. <laughs> it just made me laugh so much. <laughs> who is Matorsicles? I'm looking at something right now. The International Code of Zoological Nomenclature does not offer any provision for forming a genitive form from two persons having different names. Oh, this is about Ostrom Maisie. Yeah. Right. Oh, so the, Utah the, after. The, the rule yeah, that was invoked Utah. at the time that this was renamed is that, like, if you're naming it for multiple people, so in this instance, it's kind of named after these two people, that it was like, if one of them is male, then you use the, the suffix orum. Um, and again, I'm like, James has said this in the past, and I'll, I'll concur with this, which is that, like, following the grammatical rules usually results in a name that sounds better because that's how the language was constructed. But especially in this case i don't think there's an appreciable difference between edward's eye and edward's orum yeah no and i think also there's a there's an interesting dilemma that is like so yes in latin if you're if it's a group that in so it's arum is the feminine genitive plural ending so that's of multiple women orum is for multiple men and i think when it's a group that's mixed sex you were supposed to use the the genitive for multiple men yes um if my if my memory of my six years of latin is is serving me well hashtag patriarchy um, hashtag patriarchy. go watch the barbie movie everybody they were doing patriarchy great and they were not hiding it um look at these horses so <laughs> um the thing is though i think there's an interesting case to be made in a lot of these cases that you're not naming it after multiple individuals you're naming it after a family yeah Right. And and a family in Latin was considered to be like a plural, right? You talk about like the Julii. Right? These are the, that's the, the that's the clan Julius, right? Um in English we generally consider like philosophically a family to be a singular thing. Right? Like my family is not a plural, it's it's the people in my family. It, mm-hmm. it is a singular unit that it's like a pile of dirt. Yeah. The pile is, it's not multiple dirts, it's one pile. And so I think that it's kind of more in the spirit of how we consider things in English, at least, to make it a singular genitive ending, um, which is a component I haven't seen discussed a lot. Like, if it's named after the Edwards family, it's Edwards I. It, I, it, I don't think that makes it Edwards Orem. Interesting. 
Um, but it, but this doesn't matter one bit. No, it doesn't. It, it, <laughs> it, it's fine. Um, yeah, I you know I'm generally I'm generally into trying to follow the grammar when you can, but I think there are cases where it's a lot clunkier. And and ultimately, the mouthfeel of the name is probably more important than the grammatical correctness. Um, do, you, do you know what would have probably had absolutely awful mouthfeel? This. This animal, because of all of those spikes and stuff that it has all over yes. it. Yeah. Let's talk about those. Hey, guys, in our comments who say we don't talk about the design at all anymore, we're going to talk about the design now. Yeah. At all, right now. Anyway, so the material properties of Spinosaurus's tail spines are probably <laughs> indicative of the fact that it could... Um, Watch our Spinosaurus video to find out whenever it is chosen by the wheel. So the design... Spikes. It's got them. Oh my god, there are so many of them. Sauropelta... What are we going to do? ...is a beautiful fossil. Um, like, like several... Not all. Some ankylosaurs are shockingly fragmentary. But, um... Like ankylosaurus. Like ankylosaurus. But, like, many ankylosaurs, by virtue of being encased in, a, in living armor, the fossils that they produce can sometimes be gorgeous and basically just be like, ah, that's what the animal looked like. And there is... In particular, I'm thinking of the one on display at the AMH, a Sauropelta that's like, oh, that's what most of Sauropelta looked like. And you can just see it. It's amazing. It's also kind of amazing because the cloverleaf formation is not known for beautiful fossil material a lot of the time. Like, the cloverleaf, the preservation quality varies a lot. Cloverleaf stuff is sometimes beautiful and is sometimes really, really, like, punky um yeah. and and it's infrequently articulated to my understanding so i've seen the the kind of, oh no i should let you keep going because i don't think i'm allowed to talk about this but go on the, well then there we go um yeah it's just you know it's cloverly preservation is usually not that kind of associated beautiful like i always thought sauropelta was like a dinosaur park animal or, or Hell Creek, where, where there's more of these associated beautifully mm. preserved specimens. Um, it kind of blows my mind that it's cloverly and you're able to pull basically the whole thing out of the ground. Scott, what were you going to say? I was I was going to say that uh, I've seen the, the like, kind of running the gambit of cloverly things. Of, I've seen a couple things in our collection from the cloverly that are, like, like this is... This is garbage. This is terrible. Why did you bring this back? So I think the only real criticism I have about the design is that the the kind of larger um, osteoderms on the back, so the smaller, like, regular... Or I'm sorry, the larger of the rows of these spikes here, these white things, um, I think are too large and are kind of the wrong shape. Like, from Sora Pelta, and we'll flash the image, I'm sure we've shown it before, right? We know that they're... I would say, looking at them, maybe on average, like, four times the size of the smaller pavement of bony plates that we can see between them. These oh, these look quite a bit larger in some places. It's a really small nitpick. Yeah. I think my... I have a few nitpicks about the, the armor, which is that, like, these back here, I think, have a good shape, or they have a really round base. Um, the ones up at the front have kind of a more square base that I don't think Sauropelta had. And then I mentioned this as we were getting ready to call, but or getting ready to record. But it, from what we can tell of Sauropelta, it looks like there are no midline osteoderms. So there's a few that they've included here, like here, here, here. Whereas there should be no osteoderms and maybe even a small ridge running down the back where then the rest of them kind of fan out from. It's again, it's a very minor nitpick. Right. And, and that's a nitpick we've made with a lot of the armor in this game. Right, because dinosaurs, as archosaurs, would have generally had bilaterally paired osteoderms. So you're going to have rows that are equal on each side, but one on each side of the midline of the body. Um, and so I'm not aware of archosaurs that really do have single midline osteoderm elements. Ceratosaurus, might... maybe. Yeah. Well, Ceratosaurus but... is a good example. Yeah. yeah. Although I do wonder if that's a complete... Yeah, maybe they were paired. I don't know. Row. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't, don't know, know, but that might be the only example. And in any case, like, we know the, what the spines have. in the back of like sauropods and stuff weren't osteoderms. No, those are inferred to be keratin. Yeah. Yeah. 
huh. like in a blog. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I'm not thinking of any. Um, the other thing I or Scott, would you like to talk about the head? Oh, yeah, I can do that. Um, so the other thing about this guy is Dalton, if we could switch to one where the, the, the head's sun, in yeah. the sun, just to because while while I do think this game is gorgeous, it's it's does not understand that things in the shade can still be lit by reflections from other stuff. Yeah. And so everything is in the shade might as well be nighttime. It's I feel like a bird. Thing I want oh, from a sequel oh, to screw this. you, you man. <laughs> Here we go. I'm going to pause so it doesn't turn. There we go. You were going to say, James? Well, the only thing I want from Jurassic World Evolution 3, in addition to new dinosaurs, for us to make another two and a half year long YouTube series out of, is... Um, a lighting system that doesn't suck ass which just like <laughs> would theoretically light things like they exist in the real world and not like the sun is some gigantic stage light that's being projected at the earth baking everything so th this is this is also um unrelated stunlock for a half a second um this is reminding me of this comic that i saw a little while ago of like this guy with a, like a little parakeet in a cage and like parakeet singing and stuff. And he wants it to be quiet. So he puts a sheet over the, over the pair, uh, over the cage and the parakeet's like, ah, nighttime goes to sleep. And then it's just like the scene from Jurassic park with the T-Rex chasing the Jeep. And then the rag top of the Jeep gets ripped off by a, <laughs> a, a by a log and hits the T-Rex in the face. And it just stops for a second. It's like, and then it's just, <laughs> nighttime. Nighttime. <laughs> just <laughs> I, wonder how far back that oh it's nighttime must sleep right now goes because if if we're bracketing this and this is actually this is a conversation i had with rob the other day um hi rob you're getting a better shout out this time than me calling you out for not answering my text for going to see the meg too which was awesome by the way did he uh, go with you he did um, okay, good. but if we bracket that out people do that to crocs this is true. Yeah. I I bet dinosaurs did this. When I was uh, when I was young. I'm sorry, Amelia, you go ahead first. I was just going to say in Crocs, is it a go to sleep response or is it just a typical throw a blanket over an animal and they like, calm down response? Because we do this back home with our 20 pound Maine Coon who sometimes gets like a want for blood of your ankles, like to get him to stop. We cover him with a blanket and he'll blanket. stop. He'll just kind of like plop down and hang out under the blanket. Oh. But to my understanding, it's more that in Crocs. Yeah. Um, now, I learned about that. This is a good segue for the story I was going to tell. I learned about that behavior from the crocodile hunter when I was a child. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, throwing something over their eyes, eyes of bird, like um, emus and things. So I was like a kid. Um, and I'm, I'm a couple of years older than my sister, one of my sisters. Um, and we were like roughhousing, right? Like chasing each other around, trying to like wrestle each other and everything. And um, I was like, I could probably win this by covering her eyes so she'll calm down, assuming that she had the animalistic tendencies of a crocodilian. <laughs> um, so Does I, she, James? I, well, <laughs> it depends on who you ask, probably. So... I um, did my best to, like, put her in a headlock of some sort and put my hands over her eyes to calm her down. <laughs> go to sleep! Like, go to sleep! Go to sleep! <laughs> <laughs> um, I was then um, bitten extremely hard. <laughs> oh my god, she does have the animalistic tendencies of a crocodile. Right, right, right. Yeah, so she she bit the shit out of my hand and was not relaxed, and I was very surprised about that at the time. That's how we learn. It is how we learn. So. Oh, anyway, so I, so with Montonia. I, no, oh, what is this? Uh, Sorpelta. Sorpelta. Well, I was, <laughs> so I was going to say before we went on our Unrelated stunlock there, or patented skeleton crew unrelated stunlock. <laughs> this is the content that you subscribe for, everybody. It, it, it is, according to most of the people who subscribe. Right. Yep. <clears throat> yep. So 
Uh, another incredibly tiny nitpick with this thing's osteoderms is on the head. Uh, you might have heard in our video on uh, on Uoplocephalus, or even more surprisingly, on our live stream where we played Second Extinction, that one of the most <laughs> amazing terms for uh, for anatomy that I've learned. Anyways, is the name for the little scoots on the heads of ankylosaurs that fuse together in this kind of like like cobblestone-y sort of orientation that you can see here is capitegulae. Again, talking about good mouthfeel. That's a word with some good mouthfeel. Uh, but unfortunately, Sauropelta seems to be one of the ankylosaurs where this sort of very distinctive capitegulae like cobblestone pattern would not have really been visible or notable at least from what we can infer from the skeleton um there is some debate over whether uh, like over whether this kind of like uh, because oh I'm, I'm bearing the lead a little bit uh and the reason why is because it seems that the sutures between the different osteoderms are obliterated uh, in between each other, so they just kind of fuse into what looks like one solid helmet piece. And there's a bit of a debate over whether that obliteration of the sutures is something that happens, uh, is an actual feature of this skeleton, that that is just something that Sauropelta did, or if this is taphonomic. Uh, um, and for those of you who are unaware, taphonomy uh, is, I like to refer to it as, it's the science of death and destruction. And it's everything that happens after an animal dies and before discovery, basically. And after discovery, too, a bit. Uh, if you let something like sit around in the basement of the AMH and get rained on and set on fire and stuff like that, this is unrelated to other things. Um, but so whether this was kind of eroded to kind of like muddy those sutures and that's why they're not really visible or if the animal like actually kind of would have just had a solid sort of like bone plate there. So that's another very tiny nitpick. Oh no, Alex is on the move. Where are you going, buddy? <laughs> HP Lovecraft, cosmic horror. My family's wealthy. Okay, I, I have a question. So, Alex, where, where where does this thing place? What what is? Do you want to go on your phylogenum stomach? I will. I, I will talk about phylogenum in the absence. Oh, you'll do it for him? All right. Of, of Alex. He has no mouth and he must phylogenum. So much. Don't you mean you have no mouth and you must scream? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave this call and f up the recording. <laughs> Intentionally. <laughs> much, um, much like Nodosaurus, which we talked about before on this channel, uh, Sauropelta is a Nodosaur. Nodosaurs are a group of ankylosaurs, um, ankylosaurians, which are themselves part of the armored clade of herbivorous ornithischian dinosaurs called thy Thyreophora. We've seen a lot of Thyreophorans on the channel by now. We've seen uh, Nodosaurus, we've seen Euoplocephalus, we've seen Stegosaurus, we've seen Puyangosaurus. Um, there will be more to come. Uh, that is a threat. <laughs> <laughs> and as we discussed in the Notosaurus video, one of the kind of tells for this being a Notosaur is you can tell it's an Ankylosaur because it's got essentially a suit of armor, right? It's, it's covered in osteoderms head to toe, except for the underbelly. Um, and the kind of tell that it's a Notosaur is it's got big spikes and it doesn't have any kind of ornament on the tail. It's got osteoderms, it's got... but it's got a long skinny tail. It doesn't have a club. N Nodo tail club. Exactly. And back when we did Notosaurus, the kind of the story of that was pretty simple, which is that up in the kind of more advanced ankylosaurs in what you would consider a clade called Euankylosauria, which just excludes some of the really basal stuff like Antarctopelta, um, Conbarosaurus. Um, you would then in Euankylosaurus have two groups. On the one hand, you had Notosauridae, 
And on the other, you had Ankylosaur Day. So you're basically, basically your no clubs and your clubs. This may still be the case, but I think it's important to note that since we did our Notosaurus video, a new paper has come out. And I have it here so I can get the authors. Hang on, I just want to. So uh, let me scroll up to the top of the article so I can see the authors. A new paper has come out. It's called The Phylogenetic Relationships and Evolutionary History of the Armored Dinosaurs. So this is a new analysis looking exclusively at thyreophorans, uh, led by Thomas Raven, but it's Raven, Barrett, Joyce, and Maidment have performed this analysis. And one of the kind of unexpected results of this analysis is that they don't find Notosauridae to be a clade. They don't find all of these things that we consider notosaurs to be a monophyletic group that is sister to the ankylosaurids. When uh, did this come out? In this year, a couple like months ago, I want to say. Oh, Jesus. It's very recent. Um, I can't believe I hadn't heard about this. Yeah, and so what they find is that notosaurs are actually kind of scattered all across the ankylosaur tree um, and that they're paraphyletic. They're kind of a paraphyletic grade and that there's many little kind of subclades within them. Um, and where they find Sauropelta is most closely related to another notosaurid called Tatankacephalus, which is a great name. That's um, a very good name. And they find Bison that... Bison head. Oh, that's cool. Kind of at the base of their... Closer to the base of their ankylosauria. Um, it's up the tree from Anamantarx and Gargoyleosaurus. Um, and it's splitting Episode off. Episode full of great names. Yeah, it's a good claim. I'm sorry, Anamantarx. I, I just, I'm, because we're not going to feature it in the game. It's Anamantarx is not in the game. Amazing name. Absolutely goaded. If we were doing a name tier list, naming an armored dinosaur living citadel, Anamantarx, which is also a name with fantastic mouthfeel. Yeah. That feels cool. I absolutely love it. Um, Anamantarx is a great name. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I just, I had to interject with my love for it. It's a name James, I wish I'd come up with myself. James had to stop texting his girlfriend for a half a second there and actually participate in the video. Oh no, I'm playing Royal Match on my phone, Scott. <laughs> God damn it. I thought you were doing something much better. That's hilarious. Um, no, she's playing Red Dead right now. <laughs> but, so they, they find kind of several minor iterations on, on, a, on a new arrangement of fiery offerings. And in most of them, Sauropelta is kind of at the base of this broad ankylosaur clade. And then up the tree from Sauropelta, you have other notosaurs like Edmontonia. And then further up the tree, you have Gastonia. And Anamantarx bounces around a bit. Um, and some of the things that are sometimes considered to be more basal ankylosaurs, like... Uh, I lost my train of thought. Like Conbarosaurus, they're actually sometimes found pretty far up the tree near things like Polacanthus. So huh. the exact arrangement of ankylosaurs, like all phylogenies, and especially like all phylogenies of entirely extinct groups, is an evolving question itself. Um, and whether it remains, whether Notosauridae ultimately pans out to be a clade, or if it pans out to be a grade of kind of this morphotype of ankylosaur, uh, in any case, it's a decent descriptive term uh, for a lot of these guys. And that's that's where we stand with Sauropelta. Yeah, it, it would wind up a descriptive term kind of along the uh, same vein as a pro sauropod. Yeah, a term I right? love. Yeah. It's just something... I'm sorry? It's a term I love. I love pro sauropod. Right. I mean, it, you know, sometimes paraphyletic groupings are useful. Um, pachyderms. Is, pa well, pachyderms polyphyletic. Which oh. is even worse. <laughs> uh, truly, truly a bastard clay. Um, no, I, I think, uh, you know, there was a very important emphasis about 30 years ago, kind of con continuing to the present, um, in which old school paraphyletic groups were discarded. Right, we'd stopped calling things prosauropods because we recognized these are not a group of animals that are related by evolution. They're only recognized by lacking traits of more derived groups, right? And that's effectively the way to think about paraphyly, right? Mm -hmm. It's when you define a clade not just by common ancestry but also by what it doesn't have. 
for if you tried to exclude birds from dinosaurs, you'd be saying all descendants of this common ancestor that's diagnosed by these traits and goes here on the evolutionary tree, but not the ones that fly and have feathers, because that makes them something else in that in that uh, mindset. Um, and so it's good that we recognize that these are not groups we should be using for classification. They do often make communication much clearer, because like. I will die saying dinosaur to mean non-avian dinosaur. I mean, phylogenetically, it doesn't mean that. But if I talk about it colloquially, everybody knows what I mean. And it's useful because avian dinosaurs are very different in a lot of ways. And, you know, they, they conjure a completely different image in the mind of a listener. So it can be useful to use dinosaurs in the traditional paraphyletic sense, even though we define the clade monophyletically and correctly. As including birds. Yeah. That's it. Did we want to talk about the shoulders at all? The shoulder spikes? Yeah. Um, oh, I, I can I can really quickly just say something that I don't think warrants much discussion before we talk about the shoulder spikes, but is the opposite of a nitpick, which is a very slight congratulations. And these are the best ornithischian feet I've seen in any dinosaur in this entire game. Yeah. Yeah, look at them. Those are pretty good. Like, they have, they have, the only nitpick I have is they have too, too many claws. Mm -hmm. The digits, digits four and five have claws when they shouldn't. On the hand. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Like, that's perfect. They're good little tussers. I think that I think it even has the proper number of t- like toes on the back feet and stuff like this remarkably well done. Yeah, clearly the person who uh, did this design was doing a lot of research like they, they got a lot right here. That's not gotten right in a lot of the other designs. Um, it is really weird. I'll, I'll just say just yeah, it is ahead. really weird that like certain animals in this game are portrayed with a level of scientific rigor and attention that is almost frightening. And Sora Pelta is one of them. Like, <laughs> sure, there's like viewer, as you might be able to to guess from the fact that our major complaints about this design are some of the shape of some of the osteoderms on the back is a little bit weird when you get a bit more anterior. And they're probably like two to three centimeters too large in diameter at, at their largest um, at their largest size and there's about three of them on the midline that shouldn't be there there's not much to critique about this design yeah I mean it's just absolutely fucking shameful they completely fucked up this model it's absolutely <laughs> so, disgraceful I can't believe that so we're thinking this. D tier right oh, yeah. I think we're inventing a new tier for this oh man Tartarus but, okay, tier. okay so um on the shoulder spikes, though. I was about to bring those up. Oh, um, sorry. If you want to well, segue into that. Yeah, so um, there's an articulated neck of Polycanthus. Uh, or not Polycanthus. This is Sauropelta. <laughs> there's no neck of Sauropelta. Uh, uh, <laughs> you made me do it. Yeah. The old ha- you can't keep the basal uh, ankylosaurians correct, and neither can I. Um, I'm not familiar with the entire set of material that's referred to Sauropelta right now. But at the AMNH, as Amelia reminded us, there's this, you know, articulated neck and head with the um, first three spikes in the cervical series, which matches the conformation seen here in the game almost exactly. So, like, that's mm-hmm. right. You could From overlay the that the image. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it, it's I mean, and we'll show it during editing like that looks very correct. Thank you, Amelia, um, for the pictures. Of yes, course. thank you. Um, what I'm not sure about, and we did some research before recording and we couldn't really find an answer, so we decided to just address in the video, is the arrangement of the shoulder spikes. Um, Generally, animals in this region of the tree have large spikes over the shoulders. I don't know if they're frequently this big. They look a little bit exaggerated here. Um, But I don't know. And the orientation of those spikes has been depicted differently. I really like this kind of mm-hmm. like dorsolateral orientation where they, I, I think they match with the body contour well and match with the contour of the upper row of cervical yeah. spikes. 
Um, this arrangement seems to be based on the skeletal mount of Animantarks, which shows this sort of, um, you know, kind of dorsolateral orientation. We've also seen them reconstructed as coming out ventrolaterally, so kind of to the side and down a little bit, which seems to be plausible. Um, it's the only thing I would really say is a major unknown about how Star Pelta looks. Scott, you look confused. Did you lose Alex? Al- Alex is currently on my monitor. <laughs> Watch, you must be trying to open a porn tab. <laughs> Yeah, and if, and if anyone, if anyone watching has a stronger answer or, or knows a source that would illuminate the orientation of these shoulder spikes, please let us know in the comments. It's just we could not he, find it. Yes, actually, please do. It would be really helpful to us because we just don't really know. But I suspect it could be known scientifically. We're just, you know, none of us specialize in these animals. Mm hmm. Oh, hang on. I like this. Like, um, I thought it was black, but it's pretty dark color. This is nice. It's a very it's a nice, nice color. color. Yeah. So, like, and the shoulder spikes in that kind of upward orientation, I think, also make a bit more sense ecologically, uh, because this isn't a super tall critter. Mm-hmm. No, it's not. That's a good point. And, like, like an average person would be taller than Sauropelta. Like, and, and Kylosaurus are... to say I'm taller than Sauropelta. I James, see James was actually been... God. I see, I see where you're going. You can't surprise me. Um, Makes a cool sense. Can I also just say... Without the spikes pointing up. <laughs> Why is your cat upset, Amelia? It's my cat. I was oh, gonna say, he's vibing. We're, we're hanging out here. He's purring. He's having a great time. He's over chatting to a what looks like the return the slab creature sitting on our ottoman. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Can I also just say that, like, the the sounds that this animal has been making are just delightful. It has such an incredible range of honks and hoots and bellows and garbles and stuff. Guest appearance. It's an A. Oh my god, he, he's oh my transformed god. from I'm experiencing the ladybug. metamorphosis. I'm gonna shed from all my ladybugs back to human. Beautiful. Franz Kafka, everybody. I don't everybody. know what anyone's saying, but I said A because I think it looks neat. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> um. <laughs> so. <laughs> Jesus. So I was going to make a point that um, Sauropelta is not a super tall critter. Mm-hmm. Uh, that ankylosaurs are, I envision them in my head. It will, like I, I have the opposite problem with ankylosaurs that I do with hadrosaurs. That with hadrosaurs, whenever I'm picturing them in my head, I always think that they're like roughly horse size. And then when they're the size of like multiple elephants... <laughs> It blows my mind. And ankylosaurs are the opposite, where I always think they're way bigger than they actually are, and most of them are relatively small. I mean, this one, uh, it, it says on the Wikipedia that some size estimates would say that, like, even though this thing is, like, smaller, like, in terms of, like, body size than, like, a black rhino, it weighs about the same, uh, which, the dense boy... He, he's but, covered in bone on the outside yeah, and well, on the inside. It's covered in bone it's inside bone. and outside. It's bone all the way down. But um, this guy would have lived in an ecosystem with quite a few relatively large predators. Um, like uh, Acrocanthosaurus is from yes, the Clovis, right? Yeah, it, it is. Yes. Um, and yeah, that's the largest known theropod dinosaur in North America before the Tyrannosaurus evolved. Um, yes, it is. It, it's very... It, Acrocanthosaurus is shockingly large. Um, Huge. There's a mounted one named Fran, um, the quote-unquote terror of the South at the um, North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. What makes me very sad is, and I assume they couldn't do this because politically it would have been a nightmare, but if they were going to name a dinosaur the Terror of the South, I think its nickname should have been Sherman, not Fran. (laughs) 
Um, I think oh, that way down south in the land of traders. You can't do that in a state that doesn't have any old buildings because of Sherman. But um, Good. I think it would have been funny. That would have been so funny. Oh. Well, um, also, speaking of social animation, that's. I, I like that it bumps. That's yeah. fun. Um, actually, um, you know, fun fact um, Raleigh is one of the few cities that Sherman did not burn. Hmm. He just went around it. I don't think he thought it was important enough. He was just like, they, hun- they honeymooned there. <laughs> oh. Good reference, Dalton. <laughs> Actually, you know what's funny is he had a very soft spot for Louisiana for the exact same reason. He had always wanted to retire to New Orleans. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, Sherman lived a lot of his life in the South because of where he was stationed in the military. And I remember, like, apparently from some of my reading about the Civil War back when I briefly entered my, like, middle-aged dad phase when I was 14. um, Like... Sherman was very kind of personally offended and upset because he had grown to like living in the South quite a bit. And he liked liked the warm weather and he liked living in New Orleans and everything. This is and so he was funny. Like, why did, and he was like, why the hell did they have to go and be traitorous bastards? I'm going to burn every city to the ground. <laughs> Except for Raleigh. Um, anyway, uh, man, history. So, OK, I guess I guess to to put a bow on my point, I wouldn't be surprised uh, to put a bow on these points. Um, I wouldn't be too surprised if they were more kind of like slightly more upwards oriented just to kind of protect that flank and the neck and stuff from attacks from much larger predators. But um, I mean, I could also see them kind of just like sticking out sideways and kind of like they do in the social animation, kind of just like shoulder each other with him a little bit. Um, I mean, this guy also lived alongside like Deinonychus and stuff like that. I was about to say, there's also one much smaller predator that Mm -hmm. he lived with. Um, That has solid evidence of pack hunting, despite what some people would say. Yeah, I I'm much more sympathetic to the idea of some sort of cooperative hunting in Deinonychus than a lot of people are. Um, I think that the fact that we keep finding multiple of them in association with Tenontosaurus must mean something. It's happened like three or four times. Mm Mm-hmm. That's not random. Yeah. And other dromaeosaurs are not found like that. Like, if we found, if we only ever found dromaeosaurs as, like, death assemblage with large prey, I'd say, okay, maybe there's something weird going on here that, like, that's the only way they get preserved. But when it's only one species, I think that has to be interpreted as a signal of some sort. Um, oh, that said, I don't know how much damage Deinonychus could really do. Do we want to, to test uh, that? No, because I don't. I do not want to look at the Jurassic World Dynamics design. We reserve the pit. We're only visiting it once. Well, okay. Do we want to test the the Acrocanthosaurus hypothesis then? We could do that. Are Let's we do permitted that. to? Yes, we are. We've released uh, non yet featured yeah, animals. We can do that. Um, yeah, yeah. And while I'm doing this, I'll just briefly say this is from the Cloverly Formation. We think it was probably alluvial fan braided rivers. Um, I can't really find any climate data for it, except for one thing that said maybe pretty like Louisiana esque. So, yeah, if, to my understanding, it was quite warm and um, humid. We'll and we can talk more about cloverly when we talk about other things because there is a smattering of cloverly creatures in the game. Yeah, uh, cloverly do. was so warm and humid and Louisiana like that. I actually hear William Tecumseh Sherman moved there <laughs> uh, after he retired from being alive. Oh, look at him go! He's tramping around. Um, so one of the things that I actually really enjoyed doing in the previous Jurassic World game was I would very frequently make a joint Deinonychus Sauropelta exhibit. Because I, I was going to say that too. I love doing that. Yeah. Back in that game, they wouldn't kill each other. <laughs> right it was it was a nice thing before the pack hunting mechanic especially that you know you could house like these small predators that really realistically couldn't damage a larger herbivore you could just put them with them i used to do like an armored um herbivore with like dilophosaurus deinonychus velociraptor even maybe not velociraptor i think that would still kill them um you could also for a long time house these small predators with a medium-sized predator yeah. with no ill effect um, I don't remember what I used to put in with. Maybe I put like uh, Metricanthosaurus and Dilophosaurus together to kind of make like a fictional 
early crypto, early Jurassic ecosystem in China. Hmm. Um, why is he not hungry? He'll get there. The man does not hungry. See. How's his hungry. How's his hungry meter? It's going down, so. Okay. He needs tendies. Yes. <laughs> the, these are anything but tendy. <laughs> He needs some very crispy chicken tenders. He needs some <laughs> dinos on the half shell. Oh god, he's gonna get the. Be careful if he eats them raw; he might get flesh eating bacteria. It's like, I, like little sliders, but they have the toothpicks in them, and he doesn't know to take out the toothpick. <laughs> it just impales his own mouth. Hey. <laughs> oh, here we go! Oh, come on, defend yourself! Oh, he took how the is, hit! How is there no, no window? Oh, never mind. No, no, there's window shutdown sound effects. Was, he took the hit. No, he just died in like a. Well, in a standing pose. That's he unfortunate. Died with his boots on. I I didn't engineer these to be like Giga Chads, and I didn't engineer him to be a weenie. So there's no hope. It's been a long time since we've gotten to use the window shutdown sound effect. Yeah, <laughs> it has been. He did, however. I was uh. like, he bit it like exactly on the spike. So. If this was real life, that would have probably been an effective defense. Would have just stuck up in his jaw like like when you bite wrong on a tortilla chip. <laughs> well, with the, with our windows shut down, should we go to the species viewer? I think Let's we should. I have, I have literally nothing else to say about this creature. Okay. Uh, I have no qualms with this creature. It looks fine. It looks like the animal... What did we give Borealopelta? I'm what was Borealopelta Notosaurus? Notosaurus. <laughs> what did we give that one? Good question, because we kept forgetting That's it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um let me pull it up. It had to have been an A or an S. That's what I'm asking, basically. I think it was S. Okay. No, it's A. It's A. It's A. It's A. I'm oh, watching God. The video. Oh. I, I can't. It's an A. Oh. <laughs> Oh man, that's tough. I don't remember why we put it in A and not S. Did we have a reason, or were we just yeah, being negative? I, I, I think that I think that the reason that we didn't put it in S was because like it is a relatively unremarkable critter, even though it's a really good like representation mm. of the animal. I will say, looking back at it, its feet are much worse than this. Its feet are worse. Yeah. Okay. For whatever that's worth. It's not worth much to me. I don't look at the feet. Like some of you, Tarantino. Um, yeah, no, I'm no no Tarantino. Um, in any in any kind of way, I'm trying to think if there's a singular way in which I could relate to him, and I don't think there is one. Um, anyways, I don't I don't know. I don't have any problems with this. I don't. The long tail is weird, but it's funny. And I guess I'll trust you guys' assessment that like the feet are better, and I'll go ahead and give it an S because it is very nice, and like I do like. That at least one of the color patterns matches the little little puzzle man that is in front of ours in the big bone room. Which also like that's I like that specimen quite a bit because it's one of like the cool things I get to show people in the big bone room, because it's it's more impressive, you know, sitting there on a shelf than like isolated vertebrae of sauropods are, which like they're also cool, but like ankylosaurs, they're pointy. So you're going yes? Yeah. I have. What I is that? Try, okay. I'm sorry, Dalton. Oh, is that? That's no. That's, that's Notosaurus. I've I've put it in the chat. That looks so much worse than I memory. remembered it. Oh my yeah. god! Yeah. Okay. This is better than that. Holy shit. Oh but man. That's not a flattering. Notosaurus. He looks like he's asking if you have games on your phone. <laughs> <He> does. <laughs> Notosaurus <laughs> does have a much better social animation. It's it's the one where one of them just like one of them's oh, feeding yeah. and the other one just oh. walks under his tail and just keeps going and is like lifting him up and the other one's screaming and kicks him in the face. It is very good. <laughs> it's that, a really good animation. That is. I want to become a more critical person in this game, but this is a great design. So I'm not going to drag it out. It's basically paleo art it looks a little bit too good and too accurate to be in this game and i like it a tremendous amount so i'm gonna go with s tier 
Um, honestly, yeah, the, it, 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 it has become one of my favorite ankylosaurs in the whole game. Like, and reviewing it here is showing me how much I actually also just like to see it in motion. I really like it. Uh, I really like the sounds it makes. He's a good little dude. And he brings me a lot of joy uh, in his spiky little package. Uh, so S here. We've heard from Alex. He gave it an A. I, uh, you know, I'm going to say it. I think I've underappreciated this fellow. I don't generally put it in my parks. I made like a park one time as a challenge that was all of the North at the time, all of the animals that were from North America in the game and also not using any fences, just using rocks. Um, and I put it in and that's about the only time I've used it. And now I can say, I'm probably going to use this in every game. Just looking at it, like walking here, it looks really good. <laughs> it's just, a, I know, right? it's just a really nice. I, I think it might be my favorite ankylosaur in the game. Um, and I'm going to have to give it S tier. I mean, S for Sauropelta, obviously, that goes without saying. Of course. Yeah. It's, Why do we have debate? I think it's an S <laughs> tier design. Okay. Well, with that, we are going to put Sauropelta, if I can find it, because he looks similar to a lot of other things. Oh, God. Where is he? There he is. In S tier. Awesome. And now it is time. Time. Two. Two. Spin. Spin. That. That. that wheel. 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 Oh, it's on my screen. The resolution's really low, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to read what we get. Uh oh. What is it? What is it? Sinoceratops. Oh, no. Spoil issue. <laughs> oh. Well, that's the name of that video. I've been waiting to use that one for weeks. Um, yeah. All right. So, Sinoceratops. Next time. Woo. Great. We're going we're gonna to have... We have some thoughts about Sinoceratops. Next week on The Skeleton Crew, we will review Sinoceratops. Before we go, it is the time of the night in which we have to give our most sincere thanks to the patrons who make what we do possible. Um, you know, as you guys all know, we're, um, we're all working scientists and researchers in, in our field, right? This is not our full-time job at all. Um, and taking the time to make these videos as good as they can be is often difficult for us. And so the support we get on Patreon goes a really long way to making sure that we can continue to run the channel and continue to run it at a quality we're proud of and the quality that you guys deserve. And so I want to briefly thank our most generous patrons. These are our patrons at our Gorgosaurus tier on up. These patrons, as of recording this video, include Benjamin Seepser, Philip Fico, Andrew Middle, Florida Man, Max Ironpaw, Riley Sharrow, and wheat. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, the rest of our patrons will have their names scrolling now in the credits to the video. If you want to see your name on screen at the end of every one of our videos, or hear your name spoken loud, as well as get access to the Skeleton Crewmates Discord server, um, the ability to post questions in our monthly Q&A videos, and a whole host of other benefits, please consider supporting us on Patreon if you can. It really goes a long way for us, and we appreciate it tremendously. As always, please remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and leave a comment to tell us what you thought of the video. We will see you next week when we talk about Spinoceratops, everyone's least favorite ceratopsian in this game. Yep. Bye, everybody. Have a see good night. Bye. Bye.